All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now, let's jump into the episode. <laughs> Hey everyone, before we get into it today, just want to give a quick shout out to this season's sponsor, Rook. Close to a billion dollars worth of MEV has been taken out of users' pockets, and that's just on Ethereum, and that number is only getting larger, unfortunately. Rook thinks that it's time for a change, and they've built a solution which is going to automatically redirect that MEV back to where it belongs into your, the user's pockets. So you're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. I'm a huge fan of this team and what they're building, so stay tuned to find out more. All right, partner. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to John Charbonneau and Robert Miller. I am psyched for this episode. Uh, it's going to be a very good one. You want to talk a little bit about why we've got John and Robert on today? Yeah, so I think our topic is MEV in the modular stack, right? And I mean, I couldn't I couldn't imagine two better guests, basically, to, to interview about this. I think John has written some of the seminal posts about Ethereum's uh, roll-up centric roadmap and recently also hit it out of the park with um, his post uh, uh, on roll-ups aren't real roll-ups aren't real is what it was called about like I mean it's it's even hard to say what the post was about because it covered everything right like no different <laughs> se- uh, sequencer options for roll-ups to like decentralized block building and yeah it's like can really recommend this post to everyone and I think we will explore in this episode, basically, like what this roll-up centric roadmap will look like for uh, for crypto, like the different options for decentralizing sequencers, like the challenges also that rollups face in doing that. We will talk about chat sequencing and cross-domain MEV, and then ultimately we will make the bridge also to Suave. And I'm very glad that we have today Robert Miller with us, um, head of product at Flashbots. So he's one of the main folks um, in charge of actually designing and implementing Suave. And um, yeah, he's also someone who's just who has just this incredible like wealth of knowledge about um, the MEV supply chain. Um, and so yeah, I think this would be just a blast of a conversation. Agreed, Hasu. All right, let's jump right into it. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Today, Hasu and I are joined by Robert Miller of Flashbots and John Charbonneau of DBA. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us on. Good morning. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thought you were going to give us a good morning, good afternoon, good night. Um, guys, we are uh, <laughs> we are really stoked for this episode. I've uh, been looking forward to this one. Um, the title of the episode is is MEV in a modular world. So. Thus far in the first two episodes of this season, Hasu and I have really explored kind of the infrastructure, kind of from the perspective of main chain Ethereum. Uh, obviously, as, as everyone in crypto knows, the, the roadmap for Ethereum is a modular one, and a lot of MEV-based activity is going to move up the stack onto some of these, these roll-ups and layer twos. So maybe if we could just start from sort of a 10,000-foot vantage point, and John or, or Robert, whoever kind of wants to take this first, I mean, how do you see MEV changing as... Ethereum adopts this modular roadmap? Yeah, so obviously things will change a lot. There's kind of two parts to what I would say would change as you move to rollups. Um, some of it is kind of what I'll call like fundamental to rollups and that there are different kind of interactions at the boundaries between a rollup and an L1 versus potentially um, other chains um, where uh, for example, if you have like layer one sequencing for a layer two, where that is not normally the case for any kind of other chain, um, the reality is that most of it that will change is just a, the kind of simple stuff and a factor of what rollups look like today. Um, so simple example being generally all of the MAV is going to be going to be done in real time by the person who is the leader of whoever is choosing the ordering of those blocks. So if I'm doing swaps on Uniswap on L1, then generally it's the Ethereum validators who are doing that. To the extent that I move in L- to an L2, it's obviously going to be the sequencers who are doing that there, as opposed to the Ethereum L1 validators who are not going to be that kind of real-time person who's deciding the ordering for most transactions. And the big difference between most rollups today and the way that 
any other chain of work um, is the fact that all of them run centralized sequencers today, which is obviously just not a thing that we see on any other L1 chains, because if you had a centralized sequencer for an L1, I don't really know what the point of that would be. Um, and that has had a lot of nice things for users, but also obviously a lot of negative externalities and that very just kind of simple setup that all of them have taken because what effectively all of them do is we run a centralized sequencer and we keep all the order fill private and we just do a simple first come first serve because that sounds really nice for users of, yeah, you can trust us. We'll give you fast confirmations. You know, we're going to make sure that you don't get front run. We're going to give you quote unquote fair ordering of, you know, as we see everything, we're going to put it in order. And like, that sounds really nice. Um, the problems that you obviously start to see with that are a lot of the problems that we've seen with, for example, Arbitrum um, over the past months as they're thinking th through their strategy long term of when you have this simple first come first serve. And the only way that I can express my preference of what order do I want to be in that block is, well, I'm going to race to be the first person in that block. So that means people are investing in latency infrastructure, trying to co-locate with the sequencer. They're trying to spam in many cases. Um, and you start to see the result of that is you end up with an incredibly heavy load on the sequencer to the point where Arbitrum Sequencer had you know, hundreds of thousands of connections to it. And they were thinking about implementing proof of work to kind of meter those connections. Um, don't do proof of work um, as a solution to MEV um, would be my uh, only response there. Um, so all of these rollups are trying to think through their longer term strategy of, OK, we're going to have a lot of the same problems that L1 set to deal with. So you see people like Arbitrum starting to think about their longer term plans of, OK, how do we implement some kind of way for people to express their preferences and an ability to express those preferences by paying for those preferences directly, um, as opposed to just paying by investing in latency infrastructure and spam in the network. Um, so those are things like their time boost proposal or what Shannon proposed with uh, the frequent batch auction, first come, first serve variation, um, where you allow that flexibility to you know, layer on some kind of auction mechanism for people to pay um, so that you can get you know, much better, much more robust infrastructure in the same way that we see on the layer one to deal with kind of MEV today. I think the only thing that I would add to that is that um, I think L2s give you, uh, a well, specifically give you a place where you can experiment more with these tri types of different types of ordering policies in a much faster way rather than L1. It's kind of part of the thesis of the roll-up centric uh, roadmap for Ethereum that you have more space for experimentation before you can break things down to the protocol level if something works. Um, so very interested to see how these experiments were unfair ordering uh, fair in the wild. Uh, we've already seen some of it play out with the Arbitrum um, uh, airdrop a, a few weeks ago that John alluded to. Um, interested to see maybe some cryptographic solutions or you know, solutions in quotes to MEV that I've heard might launch. Um, the last thing that I would add is that I think as you have more rollups proliferating, you have more MEV that exists, not just on these rollups, but between the rollups as well. So I think we're going to see the the rise of cross-domain MEV and, and more demand for um, solutions for some kind of synchronicity between different uh, asynchronous execution environments um, as liquidity fragments to many different more places and you see more activity across yeah. different rollups. You know, I, I have a follow-up question to that, but I think we'll put a pin in it and move it to the section on shared sequencing, which we'll get to later. Uh, I, I have a question, a follow-up question for you, John. So you've written a lot about um, the roll-up centric future for Ethereum. You had some iconic articles here, um, both about that and, and sequencing. So can you give us your best guess how you think, not in terms of MEV, but just overall, how you think the ecosystem will look like in a couple of years? So the main thing that I probably expect to see out of most roll-ups is they start to look like L1s in the way that they run in very simple, traditional ways. Um, my guess is that it's not going to be all of these radically different, everyone's using a shared sequencer or everyone's using a centralized sequencer type thing. Um, my guess is that there's going to be meaningful pressure to decentralize, whether that is on a technical level slash social level if we want to, or very possibly, quite frankly, on a regulatory level of you know, guessing, but we don't know what that is going to look like. There are probably some questions when you're the only person operating this thing. Um, so there's probably going to be pressure to do that. And the simplest thing that we know works is you strap a consensus set on there. You have some form of PBS. You have some form of option um, between these validators who are on the rollups. And we know that's a system that works reasonably well. Um, so my guess is we start to see that across a lot of rollups over the next you know year plus. 
I've got a question if I can steal the mic from Michael and Hasu. Um, so John, how, how do you square things like existing consensus sets, auctions like PBS, which generally take a little bit more latency with users kind of existing desire for super low block times on rollups, as well as uh, private mempools? So how, how do you think these two things, which seem intention to me, will play out in, in the future? Sure. So as far as the latency, I understand that some rollups care a lot more about that than I care about that. Um, and that I think low latency, certainly well below Ethereum on one block times. Yeah, like you, users want that. Does it have to be 300 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds? No, I don't really think it does. I think it's fine if your blocks are you know, a second or whatever. Um, I really don't notice the difference, quite frankly, as a user. I don't get the obsession with, you know, let's do this literally at the speed of light. Um, so that would be my general intuition on latency as far as that. Um, as far as some of the privacy aspects and like layering on these kind of additional features that users like, you know, we don't want everyone to get front run and stuff. Um, my guess is it's going to be a little bit easier to implement a lot of that stuff on these rollups compared to something like, say, Ethereum. Um, because while I expect some form of PBS auction mechanism, et cetera, to arise in these rollups, they're also going to be realistically much smaller validator sets because we have a much weaker trust assumption of what can an L1 val uh, sorry of what can an L2 validator set do compared to an L1 validator set. Um, so we have a much smaller semi trusted on weak assumptions type of validator set that's probably running these. You know, maybe you have ten sequencers, twenty sequencers, whatever it is. Um, so you start to end up in a situation that looks a little more like the Mev Geth days or even a step further of Cosmos, where, you know, you start doing protocol on builders, stuff like that. You know, we're, we're not going to have these super strict requirements of what you guys have to do for Ethereum today, where we have to do this commit reveal process. And, you know, you want to support this long tail of hundreds of thousands of validators. Mm -hmm. It's probably OK to have some level of trust on, hey, you know, We'll show you the bundles in this kind of builder interface with the proposer. And yeah, if you start to steal them, we're going to kick you off because you're one of 10 or 20 validators and we know who you are and like you're gone. Um, so being able to start to offer those features when you have a known set of smaller validators becomes a lot easier. Um, and similarly enforcing those things like, you know, if you start front running, et cetera, and, you know, have some kind of privacy trust around them. I think there's two interesting things, and I'm, I'm going to go back to one thing that you said earlier about uh, a single sequencer um, that I want to follow up on there. One is it's just latency in general in these systems, and I think it's it's like not uh, very well understood generally that um, if you have an ordering protocol on your rollup that incentivizes latency gains, what you uh, the sort of the structure of the market you're incentivizing is all actors to eventually co-locate in one place. And so you may not get a rollup that has a single sequencer controlled by a, a single party, but you may get a rollup that is controlled by a single data center in a single jurisdiction somewhere subject to a single set of logs, um, which is a huge uh, surface area for regulation risk, as you were saying earlier, John. I think it's only like one step worse than having a single sequencer, you know, having your entire chain, you know, co-locating in a single, you know, Amazon or or a similar data center somewhere else within the world. Um, and what we really want is to have these systems geographically distributed across the world in many different places, mm -hmm. such that no single sequencer uh, is able to you know, impose its utility function on the network and arbitrarily censor um, a set of transactions. Um, and the, the other thing that I wanted to follow up on what you're saying is sort of push back against the notion that um, uh, the, the PBS style is only useful if you, if, if uh, I think what, what you were trying to say was, is if you don't have kind of trust requirements between uh, validators. And if you have a smaller set that, that is more trusted, um, you can use something like MevGet where you're sending bundles in the clear. And I think what is interesting about uh, PBS is not only this commit and reveal scheme and, and the privacy in it, but that it gives you the ability to iterate more quickly on um, features that are user facing than what validators would. So if you've ever worked with these these companies that run validators right now, they're not going to roll out features as quickly as your, uh, you know, your builder 69 or your beaver build uh, builder does on ETH mainnet. Um, and to bring this back as an example of a feature that you could see being offered by a builder on a roll up, but not on um, you know, probably won't be rolled out as quickly as a validator would be something like pre commitments where a user is paying a small fee to a builder uh, and in return, the builder commits to including the transaction uh, in a certain place with certain state 
before that um, the the builder's block has actually been included on chain. Um, so I think it, like this PBS style is still useful even in the absence of uh, you know, super hard trustlessness requirements that you're, you're gesturing towards. You know, that, that is a very interesting answer to me. And I think maybe we should jump ahead to kind of this idea of roll-up sequencing and shared sequencing, uh, because you were saying that you would expect block builders to offer pre-commits or soft commits uh, as a service for users. Um, who do you think is kind of in the better position to offer this? Do you think it will be block builders or do you think it will be um, the sequencer who ends up selecting the block builder um, or kind of the, the proposer in that kind of system? At the rollup level, I would fully expect it to be the sequencer. I like. I think that there is a use for that type of service on Ethereum L1, particularly because the block times are so slow. I don't think you need that kind of thing at the rollup level because that's the whole point of putting on a rollup consensus. Um, is that they're going to be giving you these half second, one second type pre confirmations anyway, which is much faster than the L1 itself. Um, and while there are potentially other features that builders could certainly give you. Um, I don't think the pre-commit is necessarily as valuable, at least at the L2 level compared to the L1 level on that kind of typical UX, um, because you don't have these super long block times anymore at the L2 level. And there certainly could be other features that builders give you and are very helpful with. Um, but that one in particular, I would guess, is less applicable. Uh, so I think the unsaid reason why I brought that up as a feature is, is if, I think if you start from the place that these consensus sets need to be decentralized, then um, and they're going to be, they have centralizing tendencies and you lose some of the properties that you want if they're all co-locating in one um, data center, uh, then you, uh, like how, how do we provide users this really fast confirmation of their transactions being on chain? in the absence of having low block times. And I think pre-commitments is one way to do that, even if you have block times that are a little bit slower. That's why I think they are still interesting in the roll-up context, because I think we may have to lengthen these block times anyway. Um, and like the 300, 500 milliseconds uh, instant confirmation thing may just be an aberration of the, the past. I'm not sure that that is true, but I think that is an interesting argument and like an alternative way we can service those needs um, and why I brought it up. Do you think that any roll-ups will take that trade-off of trying to look more like a decentralization goal of an L1 where even the L2's consensus itself has longer block times and say a very decentralized committee. Um, because at that point, I would just say, why not just use the L1 as your sequencer? And, you know, you do some variation of a base rollup if you want those super, super strong guarantees. Um, because, well, so I don't know whether a rollup will try that. I would like someone to try. And I think the design space here is pretty broad um, for like doing um, you know, a little bit faster, a little bit uh, faster block times than L1, but not a based rollup, maybe based rollup, but with pre-commits. These are all like different trade-off spaces that I'd like to see tried out in practice. I don't know what is the, is the best, but I do worry that this desire that users have for super fast block times um, and the implementation of first come, first serve would lead to geographically centralized chains, which would lead to censorship um, over time. And that, that's sort of what I'm seeing in the future. And I think this is an interesting design space to play in. But frankly, I don't know what to expect people to adopt in the future. Um, the only thing that I would touch on is I think there are reasons why you you may not want to be a base rollup and independent of this too. So that's sort of a different dimension of, of choice than um, block times and pre-commits. Hey guys, I, I almost hate to jump in on such an interesting conversation here, but on the off chance that there are a couple listeners out there who might not be fully following everything that we're saying here, I'd love to almost like just back up uh, for a second and just uh, level set on sort of a definition of, of terms. So, you know, at the risk of almost starting at a, a pretty basic level, like maybe John, I could call on you because again, you've, you've done so much work on this. Can you just kind of give us a, a high level definition of what a sequencer sort of looks like today? And for an audience that's very familiar with like what a validators uh, sort of does from a functional standpoint, could you kind of compare and contrast how they're different? And then maybe like at the end of that, of that definition, if you could kind of segue into when we talk about a decentralized network of sequencers or shared sequencing that you could kind of feed into that definition. I think that'd be really helpful. Sure. Um, so the way that rollup sequencers work today is quite simple because it is one person running it for each of them. Um, as a user, I send my transaction to the centralized sequencer. Um, this centralized sequencer then determines based on what they've received, the ordering of those transactions, and they give immediate soft confirmations to users, um, which is really easy for them to do because I mean, 
in particular, they're not doing any kind of complex ordering around them, you know, waiting for long block times or anything. Um, they're basically just giving you out first come, first serve as they receive them. We give you a soft commitment of, hey, I will eventually put this on the L1 in exactly this order. Um, so you are trusting the or the sequencer for that ordering. Um, they could lie if they wanted to of, the, you know, they could reorder them, put them in a different order based on that feed that they've put out there because there is no explicit penalty against them. Um, so they're giving out that real-time feed. Um, and then after the fact, as they're doing this feed, um, as they have published that and the users have the soft, commit soft commitments, they're applying the deterministic, whatever it is for that rollup, um, state transition function of, okay, I have all these transactions, I execute all of them, and I compute what is the updated state of all of those things. Um, so generating a new state root, et cetera. Um, and pointing out, because this will probably come up later, um, that sequencing and that determining the state and executing, while they are the same party today, those are two logically distinct roles, which can be separated. Um, so just an important point, because I'm sure we'll touch on that later. Um, but that what they are doing today is they're also executing and generating that state. And then eventually they take that updated state, they post that on the L1 along with all the transaction data, et cetera. Um, and that's the point at which you actually have a confirmation now of, okay, I, any full node can look at the data that's been posted to the L1, the state root that's been posted to the L1 and say, okay, this is definitely going to be the state of this rollup. Um, in the case of optimistic rollups, the L1 isn't aware of what is finalized um, because you have this fraud challenge timeout period, but anyone, once it is posted to the L1, presuming the full transaction data is there, anyone can compute, this will be the state of this rollup. So the difference is going to be obviously decentralizing what does that actual sequencer role um, look like. So a lot of that is today you are entirely trusting that sequencer for real time censorship resistance, liveness and the ordering of your transactions. They could censor you in real time. They could go down. You know, they could reorder them as they want. They could do all of that stuff. Um, and there's really no explicit penalty against them. So decentralizing that role in some way whether that be just a simple leader selection algorithm or you just implement a whole new consensus mechanism on this layer two that looks very much like an L1 at that point, such that there is an actual penalty. Um, so in the simple example there, if say, you know, we throw Tendermint on a rollup to decentralize that sequencer, as opposed to the centralized sequencer just giving you out the soft commitment, you now have a whole validator set on that L2 that even prior to the layer one confirming it says, yes, we also agree that this is the ordering and this is what will eventually go on the L1. Um, so if you, even before it gets posted on the L1, if you tried to change that ordering, you know, they would be slashed for reordering the chain at that point, because they have made now a much stronger soft commitment to you with the economic weight of whatever their stake is of saying, yes, this is actually what will end up on the L1. Um, and that also improves the censorship and liveness of the system, just because you are no longer uh, like waiting for just one operator to potentially censor you to mm -hmm. include your transaction. You now have, you know, maybe you're cycling through 100 validators. Um, so it improves your real time censorship resistance and ordering guarantees um, with the important point that for any mature roll up, you should get eventual censorship resistance and eventual inclusion at exactly the same rate guarantee. Um, of whatever the L1 is itself. Um, because you should always be able to, if you have a mature system, be able to force inclusion directly into the L1 itself um, and do stuff like that, such that even if the entire L2 is censoring me or they've gone down, that I can always get in through the L1 directly. Um, but those real-time guarantees get much, much better as you decentralize that operator. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I really like the example, actually, of just imagine, you know, the the issue with being a, a single sequencer, right, roll up is obviously okay for now, but you would never have that at the layer one, for instance, right? <laughs> imagine having one validator on Ethereum that defeats the entire point. Um, and I think users can kind of intuitively grasp there that um, that's probably not a permanent state of affairs. But in the meantime, it's definitely sort of a, a honeypot for MEV type activity. Maybe either Robert or John, if you want to just, before we get to that, that very important point about sequencers kind of combining the role of proposer and builder that we've separated on the, the layer one, um, could you actually just talk a little bit about the different models that we're seeing in terms of MEV on rollups? Like if you could even sort of compare and contrast the MEVA, the auction sort of style uh, that we're seeing on optimism versus Arbitrum uh, it's kind of wanting to be a, a fair ordering type rollup, whoever wants to, to take that. 
I can start riffing and John, I'm sure you'll follow up uh, when I'm done. So MEVA was this really early idea for how you handle MEV. It predates um, the official launch of, of Flashbots is in the E3 search post, I think by Carl from Optimism in 2018 or 2019. And um, uh, at, at the time, so rollups uh, were just bubbling up as an idea. It wasn't as uh, mature as the thinking now. And um, I think the team was thinking about ways to perpetually fund rollups uh, and perpetually use that funding that rollups get for public goods. Um, and MEVA, which stands for MEV Auctions, was this idea that the, the uh, rollup sequencer would auction off the right to propose a block uh, in an open market. And, and so every single block you could bid, uh, hey, I'm willing to pay one ETH or two ETH um, for the right to sequence this entire block, um, which is the idea behind MEV auctions. It's kind of interesting because there are some, some reasons why this structure isn't a, um, isn't a, a good one. And, uh, why the optimism team has, has moved away from MEVA. Um, and it differs a, a little bit from, um, uh, sort of the PBS map boost style, uh, market that we see on ETH layer one. Um, and the way that it differs is that, uh, I, as I remember the MEVA, um, structure, it is you're, um, auctioning off a block in advance. So you are buying a block in the future as opposed to bidding in real time for the existing block, which is slightly economically inefficient compared to a bunch of people bidding in real time uh, for inclusion of a full block like you have in that boost today. Uh, this, Both of these uh, auctions are in contrast to first come first serve, which is being pursued by the Arbitrum team right now and the way that most rollups actually work in practice today, where the sequencer is attempting to include transactions in the order that they receive them with sort of no way of expressing uh, your preference of priority over other other uh, transactions. And this can be problematic because it incentivizes, um, you know, one of two things, depending on the economics of the domain. The first is it incentivizes spam. So if your transaction um, is just included uh, on a first come first serve basis, and there's really uh, low fee block space, then a way that you could optimize for MEV is just to hit the sequencer as hard as you can and do your MEV search on chain. So you actually implement like a background arbitrage um, uh, uh, model in a smart contract and just repeatedly hit your smart contract, trying to background transactions probabilistically and reverting when you're not able to successfully do that. And as a searcher, you have no idea when this is going to be successful, but you're outsourcing this work of doing it to the sequencer. You're using up gas on chain because it's so cheap. And the single time when you probabilistically, um, you know, uh, are able to find some arbitrage on, on chain is going to pay for all of your reverts. Um, so this is kind of the way that we saw first come first serve play out on Solana as an example, where so, uh, searchers would send millions, tens of millions of transactions to try to capture a single liquidation, you know, probabilistically hitting the chain as much as possible. The second way that you see this play out on, on first come first serve domains, which is like Arbitrum today, uh, Optimism as well, since they're also first come first serve today, is optimizing for latency. So you try to find where this, uh, the single sequencer is, co-locate with them, and optimize to the uh, absolute smallest millisecond possible of um, latency in your code to be able to have the first transaction uh, hit the sequencer possible after some MEV extraction opportunity is created. And this creates all sorts of games that are being played today. Um, Arbitrum had a problem where uh, there was an endpoint that searchers would listen to um, on, uh, on their sequencer, and searchers would try to open up many, 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 many different connections to this endpoint, um, I think tens of thousands of them, and it was really hurting their sequencer's ability to operate an efficient, um, an efficient process. And searchers were doing this because they were able to get some level of edge in, in the latency game here. And like I said, the other externality of latency games is that it incentivize co-location in, in a single geographic location. And over time, this is a, a vector for censorship. So these are kind of the, the three broad different um, ordering uh, protocols that I would highlight to you right now. There's kind of PBS style on um, on ETH layer one with MEV boost, where you're bidding in real time, MEV auctions, where you're bidding in advance and in the future, and first come first serve, which is uh, inc trying to include transactions as they come. Um, is that what you're asking, Michael? That's exactly it.
Yes. Um, and maybe if we could actually dig into that, you know, actually, Hossi, maybe could I turn this over to, to you here? Because I know you, you gave a, a great talk about this in Mevconomics, um, which was definitely worth watching, and I would highly recommend that. But uh, basically on the, the importance of PBS on rollups or layer twos. So maybe with, um, you know, Robert's explanation there serving as a jumping off point, could you describe why it's important uh, to kind of transport this concept of PBS from ETH main chain up to the, the rollup layer? Yeah, I think uh, it, it kind of connects uh, to something that both Robert and John were, uh, were already talking about, which is uh, right now the, the sequencer in these uh, layer two domains, it basically plays two roles, right? Uh, it proposes new blocks, but it also decides on the ordering of that block. And uh, in order to, uh, to decentralize the sequencer, you need to come up with a mechanism that doesn't uh, introduce decentralizing tendencies that especially Robert was mentioning to, to either spam the chain or optimize your latency to the degree that um, the entire chain will kind of centralize or that the chain sequencing will centralize into a single uh, geographical uh, domain or jurisdiction. And, um, and so we actually know one mechanism from Ethereum layer one that, that actually require, like it, it satisfies all of these requirements. And, and that is kind of to, to have uh, a leader, you know, some leader rotation mechanism with uh, a decent amount of block time. So it's, it's not so low that that kind of latency plays an overwhelming role. And then you outsource uh, the construction of these blocks to a professional market of block builders. Um, and you, you, you kind of manage to isolate the, the, cent the centralizing pressure on, on the block building role that way. And uh, in, a, in a role where it's kind of more easily contained and you try to create as much competition as possible um, in the block builder market. And so um, I think the point of my talk was that uh, there are different mechanisms to decentralize layer two sequencers and um, PBS, the PBS that we know from, from layer one uh, is, is the, the, the best thing that we have. And so I think it would be very worthwhile for more uh, layer twos and, and roll-up ecosystems to, um, to, to think about how they can best port this model to their respective domains. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's um, kind of a good way to frame <coughs> the rest of this uh, discussion. So maybe it, this is a little bit tough because this hasn't actually happened necessarily yet, but let's try to focus the rest of this discussion on kind of the, the sequencing role on the roll-up layer um, and talk about kind of that roadmap to decentralizing sequencer set or even shared sequencer sets. And then I want to talk about decentralizing the role of block building. And then Robert, this is really where we're probably going to call on you a lot to talk about uh, Suave um, and what that's going to look like. But maybe, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Uh, so before we before we get there, um, John, can we talk a little bit, because um, I know you've written about this pretty extensively, about what the roadmap looks like to decentralizing sequencer sets. So maybe for listeners, I, I almost kind of picture this as if you talk about decentralizing sequencer sets, that's one roll up with many dedicated sequencers that sequence transactions in that particular roll up. And there's, there's kind of this other world of shared sequencer sets where you say, hey, there are a bunch of different roll ups that settle back to Ethereum. Wouldn't it be great if there was this one network of sequencers that uh, sequence transactions for all of these different roll ups? So could you kind of talk about the roadmaps for, for both of those? So the basic consideration that a lot of these rollups are going to be taking when they're thinking about like how do we decentralize this um, is rollups want to effectively inherit the guarantees of what their layer one is eventually. So that includes the censorship resistance and liveness of that system. Um, so the simplest way to do that is a form of shared sequencer is just let the layer one sequence your blocks for you effectively. Um, this is some variation of what's been called total anarchy based rollups, uh, pure fork choice. There's a number of them. Um, but the basic idea is you're letting the L1 choose your ordering for you. You have this kind of PBS interaction at the layer one where that's how your block gets selected. Um, it works, but you lose value to the L1 um, in the simple implementation of it. All the value would go to whoever is the layer one block producer, something that's a good thing. Um, that is an argument that like, for example, Justin has made in base role. So that is a, that is a desirable thing. Whereas I would point out that you don't actually lose all of the value to the layer one. Because you, you you can create kind of systems where um, 
the layer one sequencer has to burn some amount of tokens. So very similar to kind of an EIP-1559 mechanism. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, there are still ways to get value back to your rollup. It, it is trickier to do, um, but you can, you can do it. Um, but yeah, in the simple implementation, at least, that, that oh, yeah. is what it would look okay. like. Um, and for certain layers, that is not necessarily something, yeah. It, it also looks very different depending on what your layer one is, whether it's something like Celestia, whether it's something like Ethereum, do you have a smart contract that's arbitrating this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, it does start to look different across different data layers. Um, and in particular, when people were starting to talk about sovereign rollups on Bitcoin, um, where they were very against it because you could try to um, send that value down and potentially rollups don't want to. Um, for whatever reason, whether that be regulatory or otherwise, that they purposely don't want a token, et cetera. In which case, it is forcibly going to go to the L1 if you don't implement that mechanism. Um, but yes, it, it is not a strict option that it has to lose all of the value to the layer one. That is a, that is a good point, to be clear. Um, the other main thing with this that I think is the bigger problem, quite frankly, is just the UX of it of, okay, you're back to the layer one now of you get layer one block times. There, there's no really practical, effective way um, to implement faster block times, that's good if you're doing these any forms of these layer one sequencing. So that's where it comes in. Okay, for these layer twos, we implement something else in addition to what the layer one gives us, where we're always going to eventually get those layer one 100% guarantees at whatever the layer one block time is. The, the point of all these other mechanisms is, can we get like 99% guarantees or whatever number in between those layer one block times? Because most users do not want to wait that long um, is the reality of it. So the simple option that you can do is some form of, you know, you don't even necessarily need to do consensus strictly because the layer one eventually provides you consensus. You just do some form of leader selection, um, which could be, you know, you have basically tendermint like minus the consensus where it's just this kind of round robin style thing. Um, and then you just inherit the layer one consensus. There are problems with this in, in my mind when you don't have a consensus, particularly stuff like liveness. Um, you know, you're not going to be able to increment the leader quicker than the layer one blocks. You're not going to be able to give any soft good pre-confirmations in this if there isn't any kind of consensus voting off on it. Um, so the reality is I think that most of them will implement some form of consensus, um, whether that starts off as, you know, a proof of authority type of thing. I think most of it kind of gravitates towards you have a consensus that looks pretty similar to a layer one. You know, whether that's Tendermint, Hot Stuff, whatever, some variation of that, that probably gets implemented at most of these layer twos. Seems like the simplest thing. If I want, if I, if I was pressured as a rollup, whether that's regulatory pressure or whatever else to decentralize my sequencer right now, that is what I would be doing. Um, quite frankly, the tried and true tested things of implement a simple consensus set, some form of PBS on top of that. Um, the other idea that a lot of people are starting to get excited about right now is, Okay, it's kind of hard. It's kind of annoying for all the rollups to figure that out for themselves. What if we just have one layer that just figures it out for all of us, basically? And that's that idea of shared sequencer, where the layer one is a form of shared sequencer, but for the reasons that I described earlier, it's not very feature rich. You know, you're going to get slow confirmations, et cetera. So, what if we make another shared sequencing layer that is actually optimized to be a shared sequencing layer? Um, and then all of these rollups can just opt into this shared sequencer and say, hey, for all of these rollups on top of it, we will just you as use you as our sequencer. Um, and then they can still give those pre fast pre-confirmations. It's nice and easy for the rollups. We don't have to worry about figuring this out for ourselves. Um, but it does come with a host of other complications, which I imagine we'll get into as well. Yeah, could we could we get into some of those complications? Because this is um, you know, it's a pretty complicated area and one that's definitely developing sort of in in real time. Um, and, you know, from my understanding, it, you know, when I hear people talk about shared sequencer, like a shared sequencer network, it's, you know, something that's far off in the future. So can you describe why that is? What are some of the complications there? And then one question that I, that I always have listening to people talk about this is, who do you envision these sequencers being? You know, from, from one standpoint, I could imagine validators sort of on layer ones, kind of like the block daemons or figments of the world saying, hey, what makes sense for me and my business is to go and sort of be a, be a sequencer on some of these um, layer twos, do you see them being a totally independent network of sort of single sequencers? Or can you give us kind of an idea of who these sequencers might might end up being in practice? And then, yeah, some of the, the complications. As far as just who the entities are, mm -hmm. um, 
my strong guess is that they are very similar slash the same entities. It's a very similar role, yeah. potentially at higher resource requirements, since some of them will be running at a bit higher speed than, for example, layer one Ethereum, but probably not that different from a lot of other chains. Um, I think it'll be quite similar yeah. um, from that perspective. Um, and then as far as, yeah, so what the shared sequencers actually look like and what the difficulties are. Um, so the basic idea of them, uh, at least for most of them, well, I'll, I'll start with the simple case of you could have a shared sequencer that is just, you know, it is a fully stateful, normal sequencer that works the way that any proposer normally works, where I'm fully executing all the transactions for all of these chains. Um, that can obviously only scale so far because I, as one person, am probably not going to be fully executing, you know, a thousand chains. And if the goal is actually to stick a ton of rollups on top of this thing, you probably need to get a little bit more creative of, okay, how do we scale this thing and um, open it up to everyone and make it easy to deploy to. So the main idea that um, the two biggest shared sequencers have announced so far, they have a very similar concept. It's um, Espresso and Astria yeah. are the two that have announced recently. There are others who are building as well. Um, but the basic idea of what they're doing to try to scale this out to many rollups, you know, hey, we want this future of a million rollups and we want to be able to provide the CC service is back to that point that I was describing earlier of while a sequencer today does both of those roles of we tell you this is the order of transactions and then they execute and they, you know, compute the state after that. Those are logically separate roles. And so these shared sequencers completely strip those two parts out. So these shared sequencers like Espresso and Astria say, we will order your interaction or order your transactions for all these rollups and say, this is the order that we're going to include them in, but they do not execute any of them. So they have no notion and understanding of what these transactions actually are at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that re that removes the really difficult part of this because, okay, now I don't need to hold the state for these anymore. I don't need to run the computation of executing these anymore. It's very simple. I'm just a dumb pipe that is saying they go through in this order. If I um, if I can jump in here. I, I mean, I thought about this uh, a fair bit when these came out. And to me, it, it really I mean, it seems like such a like huge cop out in a sense. Because you can claim all day long, oh yeah, my sequencer, like my my proposers don't have to execute any transactions. Uh, and so it's super scalable. But guess what? On Ethereum layer one, <laughs> the proposers also don't have to execute any transactions, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, They already commit to a block without knowing what's in it. And, um, and the same will be true in these new shared sequencing layers, right? Th there is a party that still needs to execute all the transactions because they need to know uh, the state change that every single transaction will cause because otherwise they couldn't compute the most efficient ordering. And that's the block builder, right? And so in a sense, they say, yeah, the, the sequencing layer is uh, is going to be decentralized, but so far they are not really presenting any uh, any idea for how the block building layer can be decentralized, right? Because when you have yeah. a shared sequencing layer, maybe there's a hundred domains connected to it, then effectively what you need is you need this super builder, right? That, that that simulates state changes uh, across hundreds of different domains. And uh, it'll just be insanely resource, uh, yeah, like resource hungry and, and, and centralizing. And so um, I think that's that's kind of the, the downside, right, of, of cross-domain MEV and, and of shared sequencing. Yes, I definitely agree with you. Um, it, it does make it very easy on the sequencing layer because you completely remove that. You know, you no longer need validators that need to re-execute all these things. So yeah, you can in theory have a very decentralized shared sequencer set, but yes, you are pushing that problem off um, to another layer. And that's why if you talk to the teams like Espresso or Astro, they're like, yes, this does not work if you do not have someone sitting in front of the shared sequencing layer who is actually knowledgeable as to what these transactions are, because otherwise, yeah, they're just including them in a random dumb ordering. You know, most of them probably won't even work. You know, it'll be incredibly inefficient ordering. Um, for them to be good, you do need some form of builder to sit in front of them. And is that going to be one gigantic super builder who's centralized? Or is that going to be different builders running for different domains and they are accepting bids for different domains? Um, it starts to get a little more complicated the more that they're accepting there. Um, but in theory, what you would obviously like to have is a decentralized block builder that is sitting in front of them, something along the lines of Suave, um, such that, yeah, you don't need this gigantic centralized entity to sit in front of them because otherwise 
they are entirely reliant on that centralized entity to determine the ordering. They're not going to be able to enforce complicated um, things otherwise. They, they do need that entity sitting in front of them. Maybe Bert, uh, to rely on you here. Uh, so we, we, we kind of talked about how shared sequencing allows for uh, the extraction of cross-domain MEV through this kind of notion of enforced cross-domain synchronicity. Um, but um, there are other forms as well to, to kind of um, get more efficient at the extraction of cross-domain MEV, right? That don't necessarily rely on a shared sequencer. Um, so what, could you maybe walk us through what these alternatives are? Um, for example, depending on whether, uh, like for a chain that is not part of a shared sequencer or, or a chain that maybe doesn't even have the notion of proposal builder separation. I think the sort of two dominant um, models in the market would be, uh, or at least ideas that I know about, and maybe you're hinting at some third hidden idea that I don't know about possibly. Um, but uh, so the, the two models that, that I would know would be shared sequencing, so providing some atomic um, synchronicity between domains. We've already talked about that. The second is, is that um, you may not be able to provide technical atomicity, but you could provide economic atomicity to users. So another way of saying this is, is that, uh, users could express their preference that I want, um, you know, transaction one included on domain A or something to happen on domain A. And I want, um, something to happen on domain B. And I'm only willing to pay if both of these conditions are met. And in effect, by providing this economic atomicity, you get, uh, the nice properties of technical atomicity but you are outsourcing the execution of that to specialized parties that can break that down and, and make it happen on, on two different domains in the absence of um, some actual communication or shared sequencing layer between different domains. Um, and in, in that way, you don't need any integration between these domains. Um, you don't need the domain to adopt a particular type of ordering model. You don't need PBS. You just need sophisticated actors that can understand risk and are really good at executing across uh, these different domains and you know, those actors getting uh, these, these economically um, atomic bids. Um, so is that what you're gesturing at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I think I, th I think it hints basically to the question whether all chains will end up being sequenced by another chain or whether there's mm. any alternative to that world. And, um, I, I think the idea of shared sequencing is quite compelling, but I'm personally also very interested maybe to hear how we can provide similar guarantees without uh, without kind of like just giving into that idea that everybody like outsources their fortress rule in that way. Yeah, what, one thing I should probably clarify on because I realize that it, it is a bit complicated and I didn't talk on exactly the guarantee that a shared sequencer gives you. Um, so following from that example that Robert gave you. Um, so say someone like you express a preference to Suave of, hey, I will only pay if I get my transaction, you know, say I'm doing an atomic arbitrage. I only want, you know, the leg on rollup A to execute if, you know, the leg on rollup B also executes. Um, so a Suave executor can try to fulfill that preference for you and, you know, bid on both of those. Um, so what they can guarantee you is, what the state will be if I execute these things because they're stateful and they're knowledgeable of like what the result will be. So they understand that. What they can't guarantee is to your point of will both of these ch chains include these atomically in these block heights. Um, and so that is the part that a shared sequencer can give you is that kind of last leg of cutting out that last risk of it can't tell you what the result of executing these things is, but it can tell you that I will include these two transactions at these two block heights. And then the builder is what guarantees that other part of if they are included at these parts, this is the result of what they will be. Um, so it is cutting out that like last bit of risk. It is unclear how useful that is to be, to be quite frank. Um, I don't think that's honestly a selling point for rollups to opt into it at the very least of we get better assurances around cross domain MEV. I think that the selling point if shared sequences are going to be successful, it is the laziness of plugging into them and potentially they offer better network effects. I don't think that you're going to see rollups opting into it because we can probably extract better cross domain MEV more efficiently and return more value to our rollup. Like I, I don't think that's a strong selling point for them, quite frankly. Um, the one other thing I would say as far as how to get cross chain atomicity, um, it's a very different approach. It's also not live, um, but it's what Anoma has been looking at with Typhon. 
um, where you can have uh, what are called Chimera chains pop up, which are effectively on demand kind of side chains where if you have validator overlap between different chains that are running Typhon consensus, they can make those multi-chain atomic commits um, kind of on demand, making those atomicity guarantees. Um, but it's a, it's a very, very different approach. And like you need to be using Typhon to do that. It's like a sort of analogous to what's going on in the Cosmos world right now, right? Yeah, yeah ty Typhon's a re replacement for Tendermint effectively is what it is. Um, it's a kind of next iteration of that. Um, there are other changes as part of it as well. Um, but that that is one of the major changes that would be applicable here is if you have validator overlap between different chains that are running Typhon, which in practice is the case that validators tend to be overlapping between different chains, um, they can make multi-chain commitments. So you get a week, you get a weaker economic guarantee of, you know, whoever the validators overlapping are, are able to make this guarantee for you. Um, but it is a way of a very different way of trying to provide some kind of multi-chain atomicity guarantees. I think I, I want to come back to the question you asked Hasu, which I thought was a very interesting um, prompt of, uh, will all chains be sequenced by another chain in the future? Or is there some alternative? And I'm like kind of musing on it as, as we talk here. And my intuition is that, that you can't get away from having your chain sequencing be influenced by another chain. Um, and it's just degrees of how much you sort of want to submit to this or be hostily taken over by external forces in, in the market, to be honest. Um, so like at the limit, if you want to do first come first serve and you have low, uh, low, low, low block fees, what you're going to see is a market for spam come up in the world. So some chain somewhere or some sort of, um, you know, abstraction that allows a user to say, Hey, uh, spam my contract as hard as possible because I want, I have this economic preference, you know, I want, um, to land this liquidation or something like that. And this to me is kind of a hostile auction that's taking over what should be a first come first serve model. And I don't see how you prevent that from happening. Um, the alternative would be something like uh, a market for um, transaction ordering on top of first come first serve where you're paying sequencers that are supposed to be, you know, honestly reporting the, um, uh, uh, when they receive transactions locally, uh, you know, instead to dishonestly report those, uh, uh, because they're getting paid to do so. So I don't see how you can prevent these kind of out of band payments. And that would lead me to the conclusion that, uh, your all chains are going to be influenced by the ordering, uh, of another chain. When you say all chains are influenced by the ordering, I think, um, this is even true today, right? Because all that, like the, the, the biggest uh, block builders on Ethereum are basically today those um, that have the best connection to Binance, right? Who, who are best at extracting kind of sex sex arbitrage. And that, that shows the extent to which the ordering of one domain is really contingent on privilege on another domain that is really important systemically, right? And so even though Ethereum has a decentralized proposal set, it has PBS, it's still like, it has this ginormous centralization spillover from Binance. And that's why it's so important that actually more and more trading volume moves to these chains that do not have this kind of, um, well, like ordering privilege that Binance has. I think it's even stronger than that, right? It's uh, that it's so important that more and more liquidity in trading happens on actually decentralized domains rather than just moving on, onto crypto ro rails, right? Because you can imagine Binance rollup, which looks exactly like Binance. It's in exactly the same geographic location, except it's on a rollup. And I don't think it would have a substantial difference today if it's not actually properly decentralized. So I think at this point, uh, it makes sense to build a bridge to Swath. So, um, Robert, what do you think? So we talked a lot about, um, we talked a lot about kind of a world. Um, where they are now all of a sudden the execution of, of transactions is spread across many different domains, right? So we have all of these rollups, you have layer twos, probably even going to have a lot of layer threes, you have shared sequences. So how do you see the role of Swarth in that world? Um, how, how do you think kind of what is the, the starting point for users and how does like a transaction kind of track through this new and much more complicated domain? Very good prompt, and there's a lot there to unpack, Hasu. Um, 
I think from a starting point, I'm making the assumption that you need some notion of a builder um, on all these different domains because people will have complicated preferences on ordering and other types of you know actions like pre-commits that they want. So you need some builder. That's like premise one. Premise two, it needs to be decentralized. And we can talk about why that is if, if you're interested. Um, and premise three, in order for it to be de decentralized, you need some notion of, of privacy and some ability for uh, parties to make commitments to each other um, to facilitate collaboration among untrusted actors. And so what I see Suave as is this platform for parties in the MEV supply chain to make commitments and to communicate um, uh, and manage their privacy between each other to provide ordering preferences, not just to Ethereum, but all of these different domains, the L3s, the L2s, Alt L1s, maybe even centralized exchanges at some point in the future. Um, so that's one part of, of, of your question. You asked me like um, about a, a user's journey, uh, I think. Um, and the, the way that that would work would be a user needs to have some funds on Suave, which is a, a separate domain. So they would bridge funds to, to that domain. Um, and they interact with these specialized contracts that allow them to express their preferences over uh, another domain's ordering or another domain's state. You may have some preference like, Hey, I want, um, Mike to come back to the, an earlier example, like I want this transaction included in domain A and another transaction included in domain B. And I'm only willing to pay if both of these things are included at the same time. So a user creates um, uh, predominantly a signature, so not actually a, a transaction, but they create a signature that expresses this preference and passes it to the Suave executor marketplace where then uh, executors can use the privacy and uh, commitment you know, abstractions within Swap to collaborate on this and make sure that the user's preferences get executed. And only after that economic atomicity cross domain preference is executed can parties um, you know, claim the reward that the user has placed on that preference. So that's uh, a long answer on how I think about Suave and its role within these different places and sort of a, a simple example of how a user would interact with it and what's going on in the back end with executives. Hey guys, quick break from the show here. I want you to imagine something for me. Imagine swapping two stable coins on chain, paying $0 in gas, and instead getting a rebate of $2,000. This is something that's actually happened on chain. To understand how, I want to introduce and thank this season's sponsor, Rook. Zooming out for a second, the current state of affairs at MEV is billions of dollars so far have been extracted from users' pockets using MEV. Rook is coming in and saying, enough is enough. Blockchain should drive value to their users and the applications they use. It is time to leave the hobbyist era behind us if we want to move forward and we want to get this right. That's why Rook has built a custom blockchain settlement network, and it's one that gives you full control over the entire transaction lifecycle. Today, you can connect to an open source Rook node. The Rook protocol will automatically match, bundle, and auction your orders and transactions in seconds with zero gas overhead. Also, any MEV that's discoverable along the way will be returned to you, the user. Created as a collaboration between the industry's top mechanism designers and MEV engineers, Rook was built from the ground up to be scalable, safe, and programmable. You can get your own mempool, choose searchers and builders, and link your mempool with others to discover even more MEV. You can define how the MEV is shared and delivered as well. And Rook can basically process anything from transactions to meta transactions and more. This is the way that blockchains basically should have been from day one. So if you're a user listening to this, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your wallets, go to your favorite app, your node provider and say, hey, I want you to be working with these guys, Rook. I want the MEV that I create to be redistributed back to me. If you're a developer and you want to stay ahead of the game, the best way to do that is to follow them on Twitter. They are at Rook. Or even better yet, slide into their DMs. They are lightning responsive. They'll get you set up today. And if you do slide into those DMs, as always, please tell them that I sent you. I was actually just going to say, um, you know, I've, I've in all the the research that we did sort of before this season, Suave was the single most uh, topic that people wanted to hear about. Uh, so, Robert, have a, a sort of a bunch of questions for you. Um, and I don't want to get like too, too deep in the weeds too too quickly, but I'm very curious about how standardizing preferences is going to work in practice. So, like, kind of a, a question that I had, and this was actually, you know, sort of flagged to me um, as something that 
uh, searchers are pretty interested in is let's say you have two different blockchains with different uh, block times. And like, let's say to use your example, right, you want to atomically make it so that if you place transaction on blockchain A, like Ethereum with a 12 second uh, block time, and then um, let's say like Polygon with a two second blockchain, and there's a block time, and there's an arbitrage that you want to place. Let's say this arbitrage kind of pops up one second into Polygon and three seconds into Ethereum, and you lock in the, po the Polygon leg of that arbitrage, but then there's still an enormous amount of time, right, nine seconds in the Ethereum block time. So how is Suave going to make it so that you can close both legs of that arbitrage, for instance? So Suave isn't prescriptive on how exactly cross-domain MAV um, is executed on. Uh, so we sort of anticipated a bunch of different approaches in the market that were going to be taken, like Typhoon, like shared sequencing, like, like other things. And we are observing and seeing how these different execution models are, are happening, but we don't, we're not prescriptive on, on one way or another. That's the starting point. Got it. And different, different users will have different levels of risk that they're willing to take. So some users, uh, will be willing to take the risk of, Hey, maybe one leg will, will fail and the other, uh, will not. And I'm willing to, you know, execute one part of the trade and, and not another. Um, on the other, other side of this market, there may be executors that are willing to, um, you know, take that risk and, uh, they, they may charge some payment if like one leg is successful, but, but not the other. Um, and, uh, some users may be willing only to, to, to pay, uh, or to, you know, make their trades if both sides of their trade, um, are executed. And the sort of abstraction of Suave supports both of these different types of models where it's all or nothing, even with your trade or, um, only one side of your trade being executed. The complexity with that is, is if you want all or nothing with both of your trades being executed, um, if you want it to work in, in this way, then I think the assets actually need to be settled on, on like Suave, the domain itself, mm -hmm. instead of on Polygon or Arbitrum. Um, and that may be unacceptable to some users, but this is a, a possibility at least. And Suave is, is trying to support all these different potential models of who's, who is taking on what risk, how much they're paying for it, and what sort of execution uh, is happening in, in the background, whether that's Typhoon, whether that's shared sequencing, whether that's mm -hmm. just you know, a market maker that's really good at evaluating risk on, on many different domains. Um, so did that answer your, your question, it Michael? Did. On, yeah, it did. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. So the way I think we think about Swap internally, I think is definitely more as the demand side for these cross domain transactions and then kind of expose a lot of tools that allow for supply side also to emerge. Right. And these definitely include the shared sequences that John was talking about at length earlier, but also any other form. Um, and they, they kind of get easier to build and integrate, um, uh, because Swaf provides kind of the, the tools for like, uh, trustless collaboration on private data, basically. And w what I would say too, is that by aggregating this demand side, by creating, you know, to your point, uh, Michael standards for how this sort of uh, bid or value that users are willing to pay for cross-domain atomicity by exposing that to the world, you then provide incentives for, for proposers to, um, you know, pursue cross-domain atomicity uh, solutions like Typhoon, like shared sequencing, because they see, Hey, you know, there is all this value that I can, um, that I can get as a proposer if I integrate, you know, solutions that, um, make it less risky for users to execute on these types of preferences. So in that way, it creates a market that I think incentivizes the exploration of more cross-domain solutions. Excellent. I just, I have like kind of a continuing just set of questions here, but I, I really like that idea of kind of trying to approach things from the demand side. I think many arguments, especially investing arguments in crypto tend to be kind of focused on the supply side. So I love that approach. What's your sort of strategy from the swap perspective of aggregating that demand side? I think, but that might be a great, um, time to talk about um, the order flow option and how it relates to Swap, because uh, so Mike, uh, one way that we've been thinking about aggregating the demand is definitely by kind of starting out um, at the next set of features that uh, actually the order flow side of the market wants. So what we're seeing on Ethlayer one in particular uh, is the rise of what we call order flow auction. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in case your users don't know what this is, order flow auctions is this notion that you 
can send a transaction to an auction. And that auction will um, auction off the right to execute uh, a transaction behind yours, usually. And instead of the block builder or the proposer getting paid, uh, it is the user who sent that transaction getting paid um, within this auction. So it's a way for users to internalize the MEV that they create and get better execution. Um, so an auction for order flow. And um, we think this is super interesting as a way to live up to one of Flashbot's commitments of redistributing MEV. And we saw that there was a, a great amount of demand in, in the short term for this. Um, I think you need to have order flow auctions um, as, a, as a starting point, but you also need these to, to be decentralized. So I don't think it really matters what you're doing at the block builder level or the proposer level and how decentralized those are. If the dominant way that users are interacting with the chain is through, you know, a single centralized order flow, uh, order flow auction and like one endpoint to the chain, basically. Um, and so what we've been working on at Flashbots for some time is, is how do you create an order flow auction that you can decentralize that is permissionless for any searcher in the world to participate in? Um, and the follow up question that we're starting to work on now is, how do you take the outputs of that order flow auction bundles that include users transactions with searchers as well and have those be used by any block builder uh, in the universe because we don't want to create um, you know a world where only trusted block builders can get uh, the outputs of, of these order flow auctions um, so these are really taking what uh, we're working on with suave of these primitives of how do you have parties commit to each other in the MEV supply chain how do you have privacy and pulling them forward and anchoring them in um, something that we see that has market demand today in order flow auctions. So we can ensure that these this critical infrastructure is decentralized. Yeah, I, I suppose my my next question to you there is, can you just like, I, I have a pretty clear and actually order flow auctions and, and the ride, the increasing prevalence of them is definitely something Hasu and I are super interested in exploring. I think I've got a pretty good mental model for what a centralized order flow auction might look like. Um, but I'm having a little bit more trouble sort of reaching in my mind for what a decentralized order flow auction might look like. Um, so can you kind of describe some of the mechanism design that you guys are playing with at Swap and what would that actually look like in practice? Yeah, so I would point your read, your listeners, not readers, uh, to read something that I wrote um, and, and we wrote at the Flashbots team called MEV Share. Uh, and it's on the Flashbots forum, so collective.flashbots.net. It details our design for an order flow auction, um, which has privacy at the core and is permissionless for any searcher in the world to uh, participate in. And the, the way that it does that is through, um, through this notion of privacy. Um, so normally a user and a searcher are going to have a hard time collaborating because if the user sends the transaction to a searcher in clear text, the searcher can just um, take that front run the user, uh, extract all the MEV and run off with it. There's really, you know, nothing that guarantees the user that they get MEV paid back. Um, and the user has, has no, no bargaining power as well. And there's no guarantee that they won't get front run either. Um, so MEV share, uh, gets, gets around this and it, it creates a permissionless market where any user can interact with any searcher through the notion of programmable privacy, where instead of sharing, uh, transactions in the clear text with searchers, we selectively share information about those transactions with searchers who can use that information to probabilistically extract MEV. So instead of sharing your Uniswap v2 trade or SushiSwap trade, uh, trade details, you could only share, for example, the pool that you're trading on. Um, and a searcher could see, hey, this user is trading ETHUSDC. I don't know what direction. I don't know how much, but, um, if the price of ETHUSDC on Uniswap v2 moves to this amount, then you know I'm willing to buy. And if it moves the other direction, then I'm, I'm willing to sell um, and still pay some amount for this. Uh, so the, the trick here is, is to share just enough information that you can optimize for MEV, but not too much where the user gets worse outcomes. Um, but by not sharing the full transaction, you um, enable permissionless searching on, on this. Uh, the other thing that I think is important here is this notion of commitments. So um, you need some way for the user to get paid for the MEV that they're creating. And we have um, something we call a validity condition, which is passed on with the end uh, user's transaction that requires that the user gets paid some ETH 
in order uh, for the transaction to be executed. And I'm sort of coming around to the decentralized uh, a bit of this, but these two things, privacy and commitments, are what we think um, uh, enables MEV share to work and redistribute MEV back to users. And we're designing this in such a way that you're not relying on any trusted set of parties in order for the system to work, or at least not in, in the limit. Um, so in, in the future, we expect MEV share to be run just by a distributed set of nodes within a decentralized block building network uh, instead of a, a centralized entity like Flashbots itself. And we think that selective data sharing um, is an API that can be run within this, this decentralized network, as well as the notion of kind of these conditions of validity that are added to users' transactions to ensure that they're getting paid back. That's a long-winded answer of saying, um, uh, you know, we think privacy commitments are super important to the MEV supply chain, enabling parties to work together. And these are going to be features that our decentralized block building network and, and Suave offer. And they're kind of pulled forward into a centralized world um, in MEV share are designed for an order flow auction. Yeah, thanks, Robert. That makes uh, an enormous amount of sense. And yeah, we will link um, we will link to the MEV share article that, that you just referenced there. Um, I'd like to, uh, for for listeners, kind of give people a little bit more of a concrete sense of what Suave is. Um, I know there are sort of three components to it, Robert. There's the preference environment, there's the execution uh, sort of market, and then there's the decentralized uh, sort of builder. I also you know, know that Suave is kind of its own chain, and I almost think of it as kind of an alternative mempool for you know being able to express um these sorts of preferences and they actually sort of get get routed so can you kind of just describe again uh, almost from less of like a high level and more of a concrete sense just what exactly suave is and what's sort of the timeline for um development as well yeah, so suave um you know like you said are is these three things of so a preference environment and execution market and a decentralized block builder um and it is also a chain um, so uh, these are the are the same thing, and, and the way that they relate is that the chain is the place where you bring information from other domains and you expose it through oracles that users can condition their preferences on. Um, so the chain is how users are able to express their preferences, uh, and, and the chain plus its messaging layer or its mempool makes up the environment for these preferences. And when we were thinking of how to communicate this, we, we came to preference environment as, as this notion of one single place where all these preferences could be aggregated and accessed together because there are economies of scale of having these things in, in one environment um, uh, because you can optimize for MEV more the more preferences that you have in, in some place. Um, so that's the relationship between the chain and the preference environment uh, and, and how that, that works. Um, we also wanted to delineate the execution market um, because it's a super important part of Suave Works. It's uh, at, at the core of it is this notion of a competitive marketplace of specialized actors that can take these preferences and execute on them, regardless of whether it's Ethereum, whether it is a uh, you know Polygon, with Arbitrum, Solana, you know a Cosmos chain, etc. Et um, but it's very important to us that we have this specialized marketplace, and it provides a lot of interesting benefits to users. Um, this is, again, separate from the decentralized block building network because not all domains will have some notion of block building in, in PBS. Um, and really, the decentralized block building network is just a uh, specialized instance of an executor within the executor marketplace. Um, but it is kind of logically separate um, in, in some ways. I hope that makes it a little bit more concrete. Um, you, you can think of uh, Suave and how to relate all these things as Suave being a chain where you express your preferences on the back end, you have these specialized executors that are competing on them. And the decentralized block building network is just one example of that. Um, does that help concretize it a little bit, Michael? Or are you looking for, for something else? Um, and I won't be offended if you are. Oh, John is. I see you on mute. Yeah, I, I have some questions on this. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify on some stuff. So I, you're saying, like, as a user, you express preferences via like the actual swap chain itself. You have funds, there is a contract to express those bids. So do you need to be going through that process of uh, using swap chain to express a preference if I just want to like send my order through the order flow auction that will eventually like plug into swap on the front end? Is that the way that you would have to communicate to it? 
I think if you have particular preferences that you want to express, like, you know, in this order flow auction, I only want this order to be executed if I am paid one ETH, as an example, then you'll probably need to condition like a special swap preference that includes those parameters on it. I think, um, if you're just a regular user and you want to use Suave, it'll be as simple for you as, uh, you know, rpc.fleshbots.net and throw it at the RPC and uh, the magic happens on the back end for you. Um, but uh, so did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, uh, another follow up kind of question I had on that was. So as far as expressing these preferences of like, let's say there's some arbitrage that I see, like I want certain transactions to close this that I see on another chain. Um, if that going through that process requires me to express a preference on Suave chain um, to communicate like this is what I want done, uh, that would imply that you're like, you're bounded by the Suave chain block times of like, if another chain that I want to express a preference for has a really fast block time and like maybe that opportunity is going to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, that would mean that Suave Chain like needs a fast block time to be able to express that preference in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. So does that kind of pressure just lead to back to the point of like you described earlier of like the pressures of low block times? Does that like incentivize Suave Chain to have super, super low block times um, and then kind of like have that race to centralization there? I think it, it is um, a little bit different on Swap Chain for what it's worth because we're really only uh, posting data about other chains and settling payments. Um, so it's like, I think in some ways less important than other domains um, that we have. Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just point that out. Um, but uh, you raise a really good point. And I do think that Swap's block times are going to be, uh, have to be faster and should be a little bit faster than other domains. On the other hand, I think there are ways to craft your preferences up front that don't require you to uh, communicate those in real time. Um, so as, as an example, uh, you, you could offer to an executor on a domain that's really fast, hey, if you get a, uh, if you spam my contract and it emits a log that says success, I'm willing to pay you some amount. And that gives an incentive up front for an executor to be spamming your contract um, at the precise moment where it needs to be without you needing to communicate that, you know, at the moment that it needs to, it'll just spam your contract a, a priori. Um, I think you could probably do th similar things with latency. And in that way, there's like upfront ways to communicate your preferences to prime executors to be working on um, lower block time domains. Makes I sense? would, John, I would also point out that, um, so you can think of Swap almost as, as it's like a, a board where basically anyone can submit their uh, transaction requests or transaction execution requests. And once you made such a request and it's floating in the Swarth mempool, then the request is basically out there and anyone who goes and executes it, they can then come and claim their payment later on after the transaction was executed. Basically, they need to execute it and then an Oracle reports the state change from the domain and then the payment can un be unlocked on the target chain. So that means that the settlement is not bound to the block time of the target chain. The settlement can basically happen at any time later. And so that's why, in my opinion, at least swap block times do not need to be lower than participating chains um, because it's basically okay for executors to claim their payment with a little bit of delay because they know the payment is trustless. If they have the transaction, they can get it included any time later and um, then they're going to get their payment. So the yeah so the, to to be clear like the the settlement after the fact isn't the part that like I was kind of getting at there because yeah that can kind of happen whenever um, it's more that kind of initial step of if it requires a transaction on Suave chain Suave chain to communicate that preference in the first place then if that block time is longer than yeah. the domain that I want to express that preference for I won't be able to express the preference in time. Um, so that's where I was yeah. wondering, like, where that sensitization so pressure. Came. I believe yeah. you can communicate all your. And correct me if I'm wrong, Robert. I believe you can communicate all your preferences um, just through kind of these pre-signed transactions. They do not actually need to be mined um, in Swap Chain in order to be commitments. Yeah, that that does work. Uh, um, you may want to. We do have a notion of like a special transaction in Swap that will carry your your signed commitments if you want to throw it in the swap mempool, um, which is what you would want if you want the maximum number of executors to access your 
your transaction if you want it to be censorship resistant. Um, if you want to skip all of that and really save on latency and it's really important for you, you could communicate it directly with executors. That is right, just with this um, sig signature model that we have been talking about. I do think you're, you're like touching on something, John, which you can't ever really get around um, just because of the laws of physics. Like there will be some cost of NMEV, which is not possible to extract because of latency. Um, and there is some kind of pressure like there is today, uh, from latency and cross domain, um, extraction on domains to centralize and have faster block times too. I think that's kind of inherent to cross domain immunity. I don't know that there's anything that we can do about that, but it is one of the reasons why it is important for us to, you know, as a community align on, uh, having real decentralization. And as a part of that, I think probably slightly longer block times than we do today. Um, in order to reduce this pressure of centralization from cross domain and in the long run. A quick follow up question. Can you elaborate a bit more on why it is exactly that? So, like, that you need a chain in certain cases to express these preferences um, and to settle them after the fact, as opposed to just having this kind of more peer to peer protocol layer part of Suave where, like, I can just communicate my intent. Um, and you know, if you execute it on the other chain, like you just get paid on that chain. Uh, like, why do we need to go through this process of like communicating that through swab and then like having this Oracle problem to go back to settle that payment after the fact of like, why can't we have this more global peer to peer layer and then just like settle on those chains themselves. And like, I'll give you a payment on that chain if you get my thing done. Uh, it's a good question, John, uh, the TLDR of it, as I understand and correct me if I'm wrong, is like, why do you need a chain, right? Why do you need a new blockchain for this thing? Um, and there's a, a few reasons. So in, in order to be economically efficient, we need some way of transmitting preferences. We think that is both, um, you know, as, uh, uh, as low cost as possible and DOS resistant. Um, one way to be DOS resistant is to force attackers to pay a cost, uh, if they, if there is spam within the network. Um, and with a blockchain, we can impose a fee during periods of network congestion. Um, by including preferences on chain, uh, and this would deter attackers. Um, but it would allow, we have designed a mechanism within Suave that we think allows as low cost as possible expression of preferences, you know, when there are not periods of congestion. And that requires you to change the actual chain itself, add a new type of transaction. And, you know, I may be wrong and Tim Bako can yell at me if I'm not, but I don't think this is something we could get through ACD today, you know, <laughs> if you're in the core development community. Um, so practically it allows us to introduce new mechanisms that we think are more economically efficient to uh, express preferences while still having the property being DOS resistant. Um, and a standalone peer to peer network that is global wouldn't have the same mechanism. Um, at least I haven't seen any design for it thus far. Um, the, the second more general thing, other than this one specific mechanism for how you achieve low cost, uh, but DOS resistant expression of preferences is the, the notion that by owning the, the sort of full stack, by being able to uh, change things on the full stack, we can, um, uh, it, it's, it's much more flexible and we can iterate more fast on many different design parameters and make tailored optimizations that, again, would be very difficult to retrofit on um, an existing domain and which you may not want on an existing domain as well. Um, so, uh, you know, example of this would be, it probably makes sense for swap chain to have a faster block time than Ethereum L1. This is just a non-starter on Ethereum L1 because, um, you know, it's optimizing for slightly different things, right? Uh, but we can offer that at, at, at at uh, swap chain. Uh, another example is, is we thought of making swap chain a rollup that is using sort of the derivation function of the rollup in order to get trustless access to L1 data and all L uh, rollup data um, so as to not need oracles uh, that have any kind of trust assumptions to it, or at least use the same trust assumptions as L1. These are examples of optimizations. Um, you know, one final one I'll throw out is we thought about replacing the uh, existing mempool within Geth with a different mempool that's optimized for even faster communication. So these kind of optimizations that we think will uh, make Suave sort of a better domain and specific for MEV. Um, does that answer your question, John? Yeah, that was great. The last thing that I'd point out maybe is neutrality. So I think um, 
as Swaf kind of moves beyond Ethereum, maybe in a couple of years, um, I think there's also the, the, the kind of kind of the question like, is it fair that like all of these preferences get settled on on an actual like settlement layer, or should this kind of be like its own standalone neutral layer that actually has like ownership and participation and so on? Um, that's crafted in like an entirely bottom up way uh, from these different domains. And I think that's something that we're thinking about because um, well, part of getting adoption for a system like that is basically designing for political neutrality um, and, and maybe the, the kind of the existing ownership uh, of Ethereum may not kind of be uh, optimized in such a way that it kind of gets buy-in from Cosmos, it gets buy-in from Solana, it gets buy-in from these centralized exchanges and so on. Yeah. That makes an enormous amount of sense. Um, guys, you've already been super generous with your time. And um, I know, you know we could probably keep going for another uh, two hours, but um, maybe we could sort of transition to, to wind down. So we've covered an enormous amount of ground today. And frankly, I think everything that Hasu and I were hoping to chat with both of you about, we've already talked about. But if you want to just leave listeners with one idea or sort of bookend the conversation with either kind of a hope for how MEV might play out on these sort of roll-ups or maybe something to avoid or just anything that you want listeners to kind of take away from the conversation. Maybe if we could just end with that. Sure. Um, so I'm definitely very hopeful that it doesn't start to just take years to decentralize these sequencers. Um, I think there's going to be meaningful pressure to probably get that done in the nearer term. And when we do that, to hopefully do that in a way that isn't just going to incentivize all of the worst centralization pressures mm. and kind of end back with the exact same guarantees, whether that's, you know, super high latency, first come, first serve type rollups. Um, because if that's what we kind of gravitate towards with them, then I don't really know how much that achieved. Um, so hopefully building these systems in a thoughtful way such that, like, we actually retain um, meaningful guarantees and decentralization across them. I think... If we want to decentralize uh, these chains, and personally I do, we need to decentralize the MEV supply chain. And that's what we're working on at Flashbots. We think to do that, you need some ability for parties that don't trust each other to make commitments to each other and to manage their privacy. And this is what we're trying to do with MEV Share. It's an early experimentation for those things within the use case of an order flow auction. If you're interested in this and interested in ensuring that MEV doesn't become a centralizing force for Ethereum and every other domain within crypto, please come work with us. We um, are super interested in collaborating with with others, um, and we're going to be working on uh, a bunch of interesting problems in the future, like how to share order flow and how to make uh, the most efficient um, order flow auction possible. So if you care about decentralizing MEV, decentralizing crypto, please come work with us, check out MEV Share, uh, and let us know if you want to collaborate. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, this has been a, a fascinating conversation. Thank you both so much for your for your time. Cheers. Thanks for taking the time, guys. All right, Halsey. That was a great episode. Big payoff uh, for listeners, I think. That was uh, a lot to digest from John and Robert. Yeah, I, I, I thought this episode was great. I, I had this mental map in my head of all the things that I wanted those guys to cover. And um, we didn't even have to steer very much at all, right? It, it just felt like they were jumping from topic to topic and getting to all of the important points. Um, yeah, so I, I really like this one. Yeah. They both came out of the gate with a lot of energy. And for listeners, we actually recorded this at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. So that was definitely tip-top performance uh, from the two of them. One one idea that I thought was very interesting, Hasu, that I wanted to get you to unpack the implications of a little more is that hypothetical that you posed about every chain being destined to be influenced by the sequencing of another chain. Robert had a very interesting answer to that, but could you kind of, I'm still kind of trying to digest what the implications are of that. Could you unpack that concept a little more? Yeah, so the reason that I, I asked this was that there is a lot of value to um, having cross-domain synchronicity because it, it yeah. basically allows for better bridging, but it also allows for the, the more economically efficient capturing of cross-domain MEV. And so I liked how John was actually also going into some of the drawbacks of that, right? So one is definitely the value capture mechanism is 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 that's direct and it's it's also like it's entirely not figured out how that would work. 
Um, also, I think the like loss of sovereignty is also like worth mentioning. And so I think in the Cosmos ecosystem today, we see um, a push towards sort of actual like applications taking control of their ordering, like through becoming um, blockchains, right? And then like ABC, ABCI plus and so on. And um, I think that the like shared sequencing is on the far other end of that spectrum where you actually give up like all your sovereignty about your sequencing. It's not even like you are on one chain with other applications and you share kind of the same sequencing rules with them like you would on Ethereum today. No, it's actually like you are on chain with all of the other chains <laughs> and like all of these chains actually share the same rules. And so that's one thing that I guess we didn't say about these shared sequencing networks, which is really that like they all need to opt into the exact same sequencing rules in order for that to work, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think that was worth pointing out. Um, and um, yeah, so I guess the, the, the question that, that I have is really like, how big is this economic pull going to be? Right. So how big is cross domain MEV going to be? And as a result, kind of this, this, this idea of all chains outsourcing, uh, their sequencing to, to the same chain. Um, and, um, I, I mean, I, I think it, in a sense, it, it's like a really scary idea, right? Because the more, uh, the more chains are going to be sequenced by the same sequencer. I mean, even if that sequencer maybe doesn't execute the transaction, then we, as we discussed, kind of there are block builders who will need to do that. And so um, that's why cross-domain MEV is really such a big centralizing effect on uh, on kind of the builder market, right? Be because it really drives up the resource requirements to be a builder. Um, not just in terms of executing the transactions at the software level, also in terms of inventory management across these different domains, risk taking, uh, balance sheet size, and so on. Um, it, it kind of really, um, yeah, it really creates this notion that that kind of someone who wants to be good at cross domain or someone who wants to be good at block building must also be good at kind of cross domain arbitrage, etc., on these different domains. And I think. That's a really scary idea. Paul, so when you when you talk about cross domain MEV as as an idea, when do you think do you think that ever shifts from being primarily sex to dex arbitrage? Because I remember getting the first time that I got very excited about this. I'm sure for you this was years before, but in listening to the Adam 2.0 white paper, you know this idea of kind of the the interchange scheduler. I thought to myself, man, that's a very cool, very compelling value proposition. But when I was doing a little bit of my research in in this season, actually, I found when you don't, you know, ignoring sex to dex arbitrage, which is a great uh, profit center for a bunch of these builders, one of the problems when it comes to cross domain uh, kind of arbitraging price differences that you might say on two decentralized exchanges, there's a reason it hasn't necessarily been the big honeypot that a lot of people thought it was going to be, which is one, that complexity around different block times that I was asking about with Suave, but then economically, the spreads of uh, decentralized exchanges are much wider than the than the spreads on on a centralized exchange. So when you think about how juicy an ARB needs to be, you know, you need to basically be able to pay for transaction costs on both decentralized exchanges. And the wider those spreads are, the less attractive the, the arbitrage is going to be. So I'm just curious how you think about cross-domain MEV evolving over time. Do you think it's this enormous, very sexy sort of pot of potential profits? Is it largely just going to be arbing the price of Binance, you know, which is kind of what it is today, which is where price discovery happens? How do you think about the evolution of cross-domain MEV? Yeah, I should caveat that by saying that I'm really not not the cross-domain MEV expert at, at, at Flashboards mm -hmm. or, or really kind of in, in the MEV space in general. But I mean, I think you touched on some very interesting points. So definitely Binance is kind of the domain against which like most arbitrage happens today. And so mm. there is a lot of cross-domain MEV. It's just against like a centralized domain, right? And so right. I guess the question then becomes, well, how does that change? Like, for, first of all, what does it mean for crypto? And I think it means today that uh, many of the top block builders are engaging in in kind of Binance, Ethereum, arbitrage, um, because that that's basically how they can best monetize their um, their block builder status, right? Um, yeah. 
how does the how is that and so this has this like spillover effect the centralization spillover effect almost from from binance to ethereum and so how does that change i think i think basically price discovery has to shift from binance to some cent, some decentralized domain whether that's an application on ethereum or on a layer two or on layer three or whether that that's like its own totally independent app chain but i think once another venue becomes the focal point for trading and liquidity then all of a sudden i think arbitraging against that domain becomes much more important yeah, yeah. very well said maybe there's another thing that that we can kind of point out so there are ways that that basically cross domain arbitrage can um can evolve and can become kind of become more, more prominent even without binance becoming less prominent and I think if you, so if you as a searcher, imagine like you're a searcher on, the, on Ethereum today. And so you, there's a lot of arbitrage basically where you don't have any way really to close this without taking balance sheet risk, right? And so maybe you don't right. engage in these at all. And so um, maybe there's very little competition for them because kind of the like Binance, the Binance lag might be very centralized, right? Of the trade. And so now all of a sudden there is this shared sequencer or this way to do kind of, express uh these these cross domain uh, preferences maybe let it be between arbitrum and, and ethereum instead of finance right and so uh now as a searcher maybe i can just participate in that opportunity whereas previously this market was close to me and it doesn't matter that i'm less efficient at closing this arbitrage opportunity than the searcher who does kind of the like ethereum binance arbitrum lag right or like ethereum binance yeah. binance arbitrum what what matters to me is that I can, like, it is very cheap now to pursue this opportunity. And so I end up at my, uh, and, and kind of the party that ends up getting the opportunity is not the one who it can extract the most opportunity from it, but who actually can pay the block builder the most or can pay the validator the most, right? And so I think what we'd see is basically the value capture for validators from these opportunities will go up because there would be more competition. So ultimately kind of the winning trade might still be done by whoever controls the Binance, the Binance lack of the trade, but uh, the opportunity set at large will become much more competitive um, and kind of the, the margins will get compressed and, and more of the revenue will go to uh, the validators on these respective domains. That, that would be one guess. Yeah. I think you might be absolutely right about that. One, one question that I had for you as well, Hossi, I didn't want to get too into the weeds technically here, but you know, you often hear, I'm, I'm sure folks, if you've tried to learn about this stuff on your own time, you know, there are a lot of these sort of, uh, you know, like uh, new actors, right? Especially that get introduced with the implementation of things like swap, like executors, right? Um, there's also in MEV share, there's the matchmaker and there are all these kind of new entities. And a question that I often try to ask myself as I close my eyes, I try to imagine who are actually doing these sorts of actions. And, you know, when I, when I kind of think about this, I think from a business standpoint, it makes sense for the kind of consensus infrastructure providers at like main chain to sort of move up the stack. So that's why I asked that question about validators, like if valid people who are validating Ethereum, if that were me, I would have the competence of, okay, securing a chain at the main chain level, then I would try to move up to rollups. And when I think about executors and what I was hearing Robert describe, I think that actually sounds a lot like searchers, right? Am I, am I right or wrong in describing that? Or how do you think the activity migrates up from main chain to this roll-up environment? Yeah, so first of all, I'd say I think there is a reason why I think especially like more technically or like architectural, like minded yeah. folks, they tend to introduce a new role. I think it's because of the logical separation. So right. anything that doesn't have to be done by the same role, they basically say this is a new role, even though in the beginning it might be like done by the same role. So in, the same part, but, yeah. in, in, in Flashbots, like we are going to run a matchmaker and we are going to run a block builder, right? Even though a block builder can also be a matchmaker. So especially uh, with regards to the executors in Suave, I, I acknowledge it's like as a term or like a concept, it's a little bit confusing because it really makes you think this is going to be a new role. Whereas it's really, it's much more of an umbrella term for a bunch of roles that already exist. So especially with regards to Suave validators, so that is not actually a new role, but that is really uh, more of an umbrella term for different parties that already exist. 
So um, a Swarth executor is anyone who can get your transaction in at the target domain. And so if you think about who, who, who would be kind of the best party to, to do that, right? Because the executor is also permissionless. So it's really about self-selection, like who will step up to fill that role of the executor in, in kind of in equilibrium. So we know at the like farthest end, we kind of have the validator because they, uh, they have kind of the ultimate uh, the ultimate monopoly over transaction ordering, right? But they also might uh, outsource this to a block builder. And the block builder themselves, they might run an MEV auction uh, where they outsource kind of uh, the ordering to searchers, right? Um, but then you may even have kind of shared sequencers, right? So they do the sequencing for different domains and so they might be an executor. But then you might have chains maybe where there isn't even like a builder. And so then the searcher kind of might just go straight to the blockchain in order to get a particular um, transaction mine. So for example, Robert was saying, what if there's what, what if there's no PBS on a chain and it just has has kind of first come first serve? Well, what's going to happen is there will kind of, there's no reason why like a kind of latency auction as a service shouldn't emerge. Because if there's some party who has this preferential access to latency on that chain, what they end up doing is they end up monetizing that in some way, whether it's in a proprietary way, but they can also outsource that. And so in TreadFi, I think you saw that uh, already a couple of times. So for example, there was, uh, there's, there are multiple privately owned um, microwave tower networks that are basically, I think it's on the order of like two to three times as fast as kind of the regular internet, the way that they send kind of information packets across the globe. And um, these microwave tower networks, they are being used by all of the big trading firms. And so that is kind of the exact same concept that you would expect um, to emerge in, in kind of a yeah, more latency sensitive crypto system. Yeah, it's, you know, the more I kind of dig into Suave, it's, it's just so impressive just in how audacious sort of the scope of the work is. And I'm just very, very curious to see how it all plays out and gets implemented in practice. Because, yeah, it's almost like every time I try to learn a little bit more about it, there's this whole new rabbit hole of concerns that I wasn't necessarily thinking about. Uh, so it's going to be phenomenal to watch you guys build that. I think my last my last question to you on this is I, again, this is, you know, we're risking getting into some pretty technical spots here, but that's what this whole episode was. So I'll just sort of ask you, you know, when I, when I sort of look at this idea of shared sequencers, the mental model that I have, again, and I think Robert mentioned this during the episode is actually borrowed a little bit from, from Cosmos a bit and their kind of idea of interchain security and validators securing multiple different chains. And my memory of, of how that works in Cosmos is there's some kind of physical limit to how many chains one validator can actually validate. And I, one of the questions that I didn't really want to get into, but I'm very curious about is, are those same limitations going to exist in shared sequencer networks in Ethereum? I would guess that they probably are. And we talked about the hardware requirements being a little bit higher as well. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to let me let me steel man something that I feel like is a non charitable interpretation of how all this gonna, is going to work. I have a feeling you're strongly going to push back, and then tell me why I'm wrong. All right, with this sort of uncharitable interpretation. But in the same way that I'm not sure, in the same way that the U.S. sometimes gets accused of, we have very good labor practices over here in the U.S., but don't look at how we actually outsource the labor in kind of Eastern markets, right? So kind of like the Nike example of, well, we have really sterling, very upstanding sort of labor practices over here, but really our sneakers get made over in uh, Bangladesh where there's less good labor practices. I think you could uncharitably make that argument with Ethereum, where we've limited what's going on on chain and Ethereum at the main chain is this kind of very neutral settlement layer where, you know, anyone can be a tiny little validator, <laughs> but you've pushed some of the less desirable aspects of it just up the ladder to, to rollups and rollups are where all the execution and the users are going to interact. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of the problems that some of the L1s kind of get rightly rightly push back mm -hmm. on, right? You've got centralized sequencers, you've got a very strong sort of push towards latency because people want faster yeah. confirmation time. So what, what's the reason why that's not necessarily the case? And how is this shared sequencer network going to solve some of these these problems? Oh, man. Um, I think, I mean, I think it's be like, I think this is happening to a degree. Um, 
that, that, that definitely like Ethereum kind of pushing these challenges of like making Ethereum scale and providing a great user experience to rollups. So I think that's by design. Uh, I think mm. maybe like Ethereum core developers were wishing that maybe like some of the rollup choices with regards to UX had been different, right? But I think it's kind of owed to the fact that while rollups are kind of non-custodial and they have this like censorship resistance mechanism, uh, so you can always get your transaction mined through the layer one contract. I think all of these kind of gave the teams working on these rollups uh, in almost like a I, I don't want to say it was a false sense of security, but like the sense of security that they really had a lot more freedom kind of to make centralizing choices and and um, uh, operate or like innovate on kind of the, the UX more so than maybe the decentralization roadmap. And um, I think the other point is just this is like the, almost like a result of kind of very intense competition between them, right? Because the market yeah. forces just pushed all of them to launch um, before having fraud proofs and, and so on, right? Before kind of being really decentralized or like before having decentralized sequences. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I think I, I really like have a hard time like blaming anyone for their choices. If I'd been in the same position, I'm sure that kind of I had felt the same pressure from market forces. And I think they all like did what they could, right? And so uh, I don't think it's, it's anyone's fault. I, um, and with regards to kind of what you asked about Cosmos, I thought it was an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Like the answer why kind of Cosmos, like the inner chain security has the scaling limit, right? We should definitely ask that in our episode on Cosmos. If I had to guess, then it's maybe a mix of, well, like the, like the Cosmos validators, they basically execute all of the transactions, right? So they don't have proposal builder separation. So that's one right. thing. And the other thing is maybe, uh, kind of about like stake re, re, uh, uh, hypothecation in the sense that maybe if they like restake quote, quote unquote, like the cosmos validator hub stake too many times, then maybe the security for everyone starts going down after a while. Right. Uh, because mm -hmm. they, they basically spread the security out over too many different host, uh, uh, customer chains. And so I could imagine maybe it's like a mix of these two or something like that. And, um, uh, yeah, I don't think maybe, I don't think necessarily that like shared sequencers will have the same problem. I think they will definitely have the problem of just the builder, like the builder role in these networks is just going to be incredibly centralized. Um, just because the, yeah. like, yeah, the, the requirements of being a cross chain builder are just so, so, so much higher than being like a Ethereum layer one builder. And, um. Yeah, frankly, that's like that. That that's why we have this like very audacious vision of decentralizing the MEB supply chain because yeah, not just on the single domain, but even like horizontally across several domains by providing different parties kind of the tools to collaborate in a trustless way. Um, uh, just so all of these roles don't have to be played by the same parties. Yeah, well said. And by the way, I don't I can't say that I would make any decisions differently than the the layer twos on Ethereum would either. Although I would, I don't know if you remember giving this quote, but it stuck with me. You said it in, I think it was like an I Pledge Allegiance podcast a little while ago about people, crypto, the, the intense cyclical nature of crypto actually culling people who make short-term decisions. And I actually was listening to you at the time because it was during a bull market and not agreeing with that quote. And then frankly, now, you know, with the benefit of a full year of bear market and watching how it's played out, I actually do agree with you a little bit. And I, this is, you know, beyond the scope of this MEV podcast necessarily, but I did, I, I found myself wondering about that exactly when I was watching this Arbitrum governance snafu play out and wondering to myself, well, do you really need that billion dollars to play around and kind of be fast and loose and match the Polygon deals or is that actually not money that's particularly well allocated that way? And if you had a, a longer term framework on it, then I, I don't know. It's maybe beyond the scope of this MEV podcast, but I do find myself wondering that quite a lot, actually. Um, all right, let's give listeners a little bit of a tease for the, the next episode here. So this next episode uh, is going to be an interview with two searchers. So this is kind of a fun callback to the original interview with a searcher that you did it's got to be back in 2020. Yeah, MEB or 2020 or 2021. Yeah. Yeah. So 
this one, this one will be fun because we'll really get into the nitty gritty of what the the searching role kind of looks like today mm-hmm. and some of the the PvP activities that go on for yeah. for searchers. Yeah, I so. think it would be very interesting to also listen back to the original episode just to hear what changed in like the the two to three years that that lay between these interviews because I think. Um, I mean, so these two searchers who are interviewing, I think they're really on top of their game. And I think mm-hmm. they give us a great overview over what it takes to be a searcher today, how much more sophisticated it is, and how much more resource intensive. I think those would be two takeaways that I'm expecting to get. Absolutely. All right, Hasi. As always, this has been a fun one. See you soon for the next episode.